I've much enjoyed listening and learning tonight. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much. And this has been a great opportunity for me personally to reflect on what this quote means to me, and then to broaden that to see if there's even more meaning in it related to what I see in the world around me. Why does this quote have such a hold on me? What must I have experienced, what triumphs, but more likely, what failures lurk, perhaps in my subconscious, waiting to resonate with these words at, at every opportunity? As you know, this famous quote is but a short snippet from a good, long speech on citizenship in a republic, which would be well worth a good read, or at least an understanding of, today. But for today, I need to simplify my thoughts down to the essence of what is simply in the words of that quote. But first, a short story, if I may, perhaps of my most important contribution at NASA as part of my first space flight. And that taught me just how big the arena can be and how fierce opponents can fight and just how the criticism can sting. It was about 1992. And I'd already been at NASA as an instructor for about five and a half years and an astronaut, actually, for a year and a half. The opportunity came for me and a small team to essentially hack in to the space shuttle main computer information stream that traditionally only goes to the mission control center. Laptops had just become powerful enough to handle the work that the mission control center was doing to process and display over 128 thousand bytes a second. Not particularly a hard task or a big deal today. But laptops are not completely reliable in space. I had four laptops on the flight deck with me, okay, just in case, and I needed to have a, a bunch of computing power there. The laptops are, are, are not completely reliable in space because the radiation that's not being blocked by the Earth's atmosphere will occasionally corrupt a bit of memory here and there in the, in the laptop. So they're not completely trustworthy. But the benefits for the crew of being able to use some of the data that wasn't already being displayed on the very limited shuttle displays, none of which had real graphics at that time, was potentially so important for the future of docking the shuttle with the space station through the ability to fuse information from multiple sensors, radar, lasers, GPS, for example, to robotic arm operations, to something as simple as updating a world map on the laptop that would let us know where we were over the Earth without having to go look out the window or ask the control center. I had no idea how protective the flight controllers were going to be of their prerogative to see all the data and to control the flight and, of course, what the crew could see and therefore do. I was peppered with spears again and again. And finally, after the lead flight director told me that he was not going to kill my little project, I felt almost encouraged and pressed ahead. We succeeded, and soon no space shuttle crew would fly without that capability. But it was a hard battle and emotionally exhausting. Why can't people just recognize what is right and good? Well, of course, that is an ironic thing to ask as our country, even our world, continually grapples with what is right and best for our future. We obviously will just will not ever all agree. At a certain level, President Roosevelt's words speak to the effort required to maintain something that he considered good in, excuse me, good in the world, a republic, as is the responsibility of the citizens of republics. But anybody who's been in the arena of any sort will probably agree that the emotional cost of that effort at a very minimum, can be very high. But must struggle be an integral part of being alive, of being human? Is the reason the species was able to leave Africa and spread to all parts of the earth is it because of an innate need and willingness to struggle? Being human, do most of us inherit this willingness and make it a part of everything we do? Is it possible to conceive of human life, or perhaps more broadly, of any life, that is not involved in a daily struggle for survival in some way, shape, or form. Survival of our way of life, of our belief system, of what we want for our country, 
etc., etc. Some of these are the proverbial first world problems. Some of mine certainly were. But for others, some in our own country, the struggle is about food and shelter. And aside, I've tried to convince my own children at times that many of the things I do as a parent are not simply arbitrary, dictatorial, and tyrannical, <laughs> but are actually motivated by a desire, by a desire that they have the best chance to succeed in life and get to have choices in what they do. Parents are among the few that really care for their children's success. Whether first world or other, life is still a competition for available resources Significant others, college admissions, job opportunities, and outcomes. These outcomes can have significant effects on our lives. Part of my own naivete is that I believed, and still do, that there are parts of the world, often our own, that are generally improving, treating people more fairly, more transparency in government, slowly but surely making improvements in our republic, but I think I failed to acknowledge how important human appetites are. There are people who hunger for certain things so much, and some who are just so good at some things, and their personal success may come at the expense of others, whether it is men abusing their power to the detriment of women, or someone accumulating wealth at the expense of others, or person accumulating political power primarily for their own benefit and not their constituents. The list goes on and on. So if I accept that this is what it means to be human, and I personally think that two of the most pressing problems for societies writ large is the civilization of young men and the education of young women. How then do we make and imbue our lives with meaning. It wasn't until I worked at NASA that I finally admitted to myself that there's not going to be a utopia in space, or anywhere else for that matter. We are obviously going to take our very human appetites and problems with us wherever we go. Now, most species do not survive very long. Oh, ants and cockroaches aside, okay? <laughs> The archaeological record is littered with evidence of the demise of species. Our own tenure on Earth is just as uncertain as any other species. As a colleague of mine pointed out, it would behoove us to have a bit of humility and a lot less arrogance. And pay attention to the real limits of a real planet. We could start with not littering. For example, we litter a lot of plastic. I also assert that discarding CO2 is littering. The list goes on. But what invests us in the future? Our own lives, certainly, while we are young enough to have a future ourselves. But certainly the lives of the young people we care about. York, two on the lower left but highlighted current Katie. <laughs> These are the people we care about, especially our own children perhaps even the children in our community and other communities. So how should we choose to live our lives? In closing, I'd like to share with you a reading from a favorite Japanese story. The story concerns a man named Musashi, a samurai struggling to achieve wisdom. The following is a brief passage describing some of his thoughts as he progressed along the way. It wasn't that he had forgotten the lesson he had been taught. The truly brave man is one who loves life cherishing it as a treasure that once forfeited can never be regained. He knew full well that to live was more than merely to survive. The problem was how to imbue his life with meaning, how to ensure that his life would cast a bright ray of light into the future, even if it became necessary to give up that life for a cause. If he succeeded in doing this, the length of his life, 20 years or 70, made little difference. A lifetime was only an insignificant interval in the endless flow of time. That, for me, is the most important question I know. How do we imbue our lives with meaning? Part of that answer should be that we have responsibilities in our republic, and that it matters 
that we be in the arena in some way ourselves and not, particularly at this time, simply criticize and not act. Life is a canvas upon which we can paint meaning, purpose. We can express our ideas as to what there is that is worth doing. We all have different and probably incomplete answers to these questions. And those of us who are older should listen and learn from what some of our younger folks' answers are, especially at this stage of our lives. And I'm certainly eager to learn those answers, what their answers are later in their lives, too, as their arenas expand and they grow with them. Good luck to our children and our future. A lot of life is about showing up. Please show up. Thank you. 